our first speaker is uh, Rosa Maria Miró Roch from University of Barcelona. Rosa was one of the first women who was a full professor in Spanish universities. Indeed, uh, she was professor in my alma mater in Zaragoza at the end of the 80s. And uh, uh, he moved after that uh, to Barcelona, where she developed a very intensive activity as a researcher, promoting a very active school. And now he is our speaker in this morning session. First of all, organizers told me that uh, I must give a present to Rosa. Uh, the problem is the, the present is empty. And I asked the organizers why it's empty, and they told me that the speaker can choose between olive oil and uh, wine or water of this Atlantic side. Okay, then Rosa. Of 
In the third one, we establish upper and lower bound for the minimal number of generators of a Togliatti system. And in the last one, we relate Togliatti system to Galois over the cycle. Okay, but let me start. As I said, the first one will be to establish a close relationship between a priori, two problems which a priori seem unrelated. The first one is pure algebra is the existence of homogeneous Archimedean ideals in the polynomial ring which fails the nuclear fixed property. And the second one will be the existence of projective varieties which satisfy the Lucella flat equation of order greater or equal than two. Where we say that an n dimensional projective variety x in the n satisfies a Laplace equation if the dimension of its oscillating space at the general point is n plus x plus f minus one minus delta. Don't worry if you don't remember the definition of oscillating space. I will recall later on. What is important is that the expected dimension of the s oscillating space at the general point is n plus f plus f minus one. And we will say that the variety satisfies a Laplace equation when the dimension is a strictly less than the expected one. And we say that an homogeneous Artinian ideal has the weak Lefschetz property if there exists a linear form such that the multiplication map from the homogeneous part of degree j of R modulo i and the homogeneous part of degree j plus one of R modulo i has maximum one which means that it is either injective or subjective. It's important to point out that this is an open condition. So if there is a linear form which verifies this property, the same will be true for a general linear form. So Lecce's properties of Artinian ideas can be seen as an algebraic generalization of the hard Lecce's theorem that was proved by Lecce's in the 19th century. This is a really very, very deep and nice theorem that I will quickly recall you. It says the following. We take a smooth and dimensional complex variety in the projective uh, space. Then in the cohomology ring of X, the K4 product with the cohomology class of the hyperplane gives us an isomorphism between the <coughs> cohomology ring of dimension n minus k and the cohomology ring of dimension n plus k. The investigation of the Lecce's properties of Artinian ideas started in the middle of the 80s and very, very quick became a very active area of research where a lot of results have been obtained. And for me, one of the interesting properties of the investigation of the Lecce's properties is its ubiquity. They appear everywhere. When you don't expect, boom, that appears a Lecce's property. And in fact, Lecce's properties have been studied and are still studied. People working in algebraic geometry, in algebraic topology, combinatories, commutative algebra, representation theory, and all of them using different tools and using different motivations and backgrounds. In my case, the interest in these properties appears after analyzing very deeply a classical example of surface in P5 which satisfies a Laplace equation of order two that was discovered by Togliatti at the beginning of the 20th century and a recent result of Brenner and Kay of an Artinian ideal which fails the Wiglepsis property. And I will start this talk by calling you these two examples. The first is the example of Brenner and Kay. They consider the polynomial ring in three variables. They take the ideal generated by x cubed, y cubed, z cubed, and f, where now f is any homogeneous form of degree three. And they prove that this ideal fails the Wittlepsch property 
Y para morir, disomogéneos formas de vivir. Que lies en la vector space generated by x cube, y cube, z cube, x y z. Y moreover, they prove that this ideal is the only monomial Artinian ideal generated by four cubics, which has the Wigner-Chitz property. On the other hand, at the beginning of the 19th century, Eugenio Togliatti proved that the only non-trivial smooth surface in P5, in P5 that we obtain projecting the Veronese surface in P9 and satisfying the Laplace equation of order 2 is the image of P2 via the linear system of cubics described in this slide. And what is the relation between these two examples? If you carefully look at the monomials that appear in the first example and the monomials that appear in the second one, you immediately realize that they are apolar to each other. And this suggests to us that maybe there is a relation between Artinian ideals that face the weak Lepschitz property and projection of the Veronese variety which satisfies at least a Laplace equation. And such relation exists, and my first goal will be to exhibit this relation. To this end, I will need to fix now some notation. <coughs> In my talk, I will always work over an algebraically closed field of characteristic zero. If you prepare, you can assume that I work over the complex numbers. I take X, a projective variety of the ancient a small n embedded in a projective space of dimension capital N. I don't assume that X is a smooth, but I pick a smooth point that I call P. I also choose an affine system of N coordinates around this smooth point and a local parametrization of X of the form P, T1, Tn. So the n components will be formal power series, and I assume that P is the image of the origin. Then, as usual, we define the tangent space to x at this point, and this will be the k-vector space generated by the n partial derivative of P at P. Since our point was a smooth, we know that the dimension of the tangent space is exactly n. Now, similarly, we can define the S osculating space. It will be the K vector space generated by all partial derivatives of P of order less or equal than S. If you compute how many partial derivatives we have, we automatically get an upper bound for the dimension of the S osculating space. It turns out that the dimension of the S osculating space at any point is bounded by n plus s choose s minus 1. And we expect that this inequality will be an equality. And we will say that our variety satisfies delta Laplace equations of order s if a strictly inequality holds for all the smooth points P of X and the dimension of the S osculating space at the general point is N plus S choose S minus 1 minus delta. So this is the definition and some remarks. Assume, for instance, that we consider a non-degenerated curve. This means that it is a curve that lies in the end, but it does not lie in a hyperplane. If we compute the dimension of the S osculating space at the general point, we get that the, this dimension is exactly S, which means that the non-degenerate curve does not satisfy any Laplace equation. And for that reason, in my talk, I will only deal with varieties of dimension greater or equal than two. The second remark is that if capital N is smaller than N plus S to S minus 1, 
then the dimension of the S osculating a space at the general point can never be L plus S choose S minus 1. So in this case, automatically X satisfies at least a Laplace equation of order S, but it is a case that is not at all interesting for us because it's for free that we have these Laplace equations. So in my talk, I will always assume that capital M is greater or equal than N plus S choose S minus 1. And the last remark is that Essentially, I will deal with rational varieties, and for rational varieties, we have a nice description of the oscillate in the space. In fact, if we have rational variety, we know that we have a rational map from Pn to X, given by n plus 1 forms of the same degree, I call D, this degree, and using the Euler formula for homogeneous polynomials, we automatically get that uh, gen at the general point P, the projective S oscillating a space of X at P is generated by the S partial derivatives of this homogeneous form F0, F1, Fn. And this notation is enough to state the problems that we would like to solve. And the problems are the following. First, we would like to classify all rational surfaces in Pn n greater or equal than 5, which satisfies a Laplace equation of order 2. The hypothesis n greater or equal than 5 comes from remark 2. I always assume that n is greater than 2 plus 2 plus 2 minus 1. We would like also to classify all rational surfaces in Pn, which satisfies at least a Laplace equation of order now S. And we can even be more ambitious, and we would like to classify all n dimensional rational varieties X in Pn, which satisfies at least a Laplace equation of order S. These three problems are open far of being solved, and you will see that as a consequence of the relation that I will obtain between ideals that fails with Lefschetz's property and varieties which satisfy the Laplace equations, we get non-trivial contributions to all of them. What I use as a main tool? As a main tool, I use macaulay manlis duality, which I will introduce you so as I said, for me, K will be an algebraically closed field of characteristic zero. B will be a K vector of space of dimension n plus one. R will be the symmetric algebra associated to be dual. So if I fix a K basis x0, x1, xn of be dual, this symmetric algebra R can be identified with the polynomial ring in n plus 1 variables. I denote by D the symmetric algebra associated to B. Again, if I fix a K basis of B, this can be identified with the polynomial ring. We have a natural action of R over D that can be seen as a partial differentiation and this action is very important because it allows us to consider D as a graded R module. Okay. Given an homogeneous ideal I, we define the inverse system or the Macaulay inverse system as all polynomials D in capital D, which are killed by all for F in I. The inverse system is a graded sub R module of D. And vice versa, if you give me a graded R sub module of D, I can define an homogeneous ideal as follow the polynomials F in R, which kill all polynomials D in N. This I call the annihilator of N, and it is an homogeneous ideal. This action by differentiation gives us a perfect 
an exact pairing that we call a polarity or Macaulay Mali's duality. And when I have two homogeneous forms of the same degree, one in R and another in D, I will say that they are polar if F till D. Okay. So with this notation, we can state Macaulay Mali's duality. It says the following. We have a bijection between homogeneous ideals I in R and graded R some modules of D. How it works? If you give me an homogeneous ideal, I will associate its inverse system. And if you give me a graded R sub module M, I will associate the annihilator. What is important is that the inverse system is finitely generated as R module, if and only if the quotient R modulo I is an R <coughs> Another important thing is that this bijection can be simplified a lot when we deal with monomial ideas. Because when we deal with monomial ideas, we can see both inside the same polynomial ring. And if we make this identification, then in the homogeneous part of degree D of the inverse system, we have all monomials of degree D which don't lie in the idea of I. For example, assume that I take the polynomial ring in three variables. We consider the idea of I generated by monomials of degree four, x4, blah, 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 until x, zeta three. And we want to compute the inverse system. In the homogeneous part of degree four of the inverse system, we will have all monomials of degree four which don't lie in I. It's very easy in this case to compute the inverse system. And the last notation that I need is the following. If I have an Artinian ideal, I generated by R forms all of the same degree, I call D this degree, I consider the Macaulay inverse system, I minus Y, I consider the homogeneous part of degree D, of the inverse system. This defines a rational map. I consider the image of the rational map, the closure of this image, and this is nothing but the projection of the Veronese variety from the linear system generated by F1, Fr. I will denote this rational variety as x and i minus one d. And now I consider the homogeneous part of the grid D of I. This defines a morphism. There is a big difference between the first application and the second one. The first one was only a rational map. Now this is a morphism. One is a morphism because I was an Artinian ideal, which means that all these polynomials don't have any common zero. So this map is really a regular map. I take now the image. This is already a closed subset. I don't need to take the closure now. But this is also, again, a projection of a Veronese variety, now from another linear system. Which linear system now I use to project? I use the vector space generated by all forms of degree D, which are which lies in the inverse system. I will denote the rational variety as X and ID, and we call them apolar. And with this notation, I can say our fair result, which is the following one. We take an Artinian ideal, I, generated by R forms of degree D, and I assume that R is smaller or equal than n plus d minus one choose n minus one. We prove that the following conditions are equivalent. The ideal I fails the weak Lipschitz property in d with d minus one. Second, all these forms become linear dependent when we restrict to a general hyperplane. And finally, the rational variety xn i minus one d 
satisfy the least Laplace equation of order d minus one. Some remarks, the hypotheses are smaller than n plus d minus one, so n minus one, n minus one was to assure that the Laplace equation that we obtain is not trivial. In particular, when we have only three variables, we, have, we are assuming that the number of polynomials is smaller than the degree plus one. So in the case of three variables, we can, for instance, recover the classical example of Dominati. And this was my first goal, not to establish a relation between an algebraic problem, the existence of ideals, which fails to be Lecture's property and a geometric problem, the existence of varieties which satisfies at least a Laplace equation. And this result also motivates the clinician. From now on, when I have an Artinian ideal generated by forms of degree d, and we have that the number of polynomials is bounded by n plus d minus 1 plus n minus 1. I would say that this is a Togliati system if it satisfies one of these three equivalent relations. So the first question is, they exist. We have plenty of examples. Let me give you one. I work in three variables. I assume that D is an odd number. I write it as 2Q plus 1. I take L1, LD, general, for, general linear forms, and I consider the ideal generated by L1 to the D, LD to the D, and the product L1, LD. This is an ideal which, which is generated by D plus one forms of degree D. And it fails the weak Lipschitz property in degree D minus one. Why? Because when we restrict to a general hyperplane, all these linear forms, all, all these forms of degree D become dependent. So automatically we know that associated to this idea, we have a surface which satisfies the Laplace equation of order D minus one. Again, if we take D equal three, we recover the classical example of Togliatti. And what happens if D is even? If D is even, the result is not true. What we really construct is an example of idea which satisfies the weak Lipschitz property. Okay. okay. From now on, I will restrict my attention to monomial ideals which from the geometric point of view means that I will deal with four varieties. And in this case, to check if the weak Lipschitz property works or not is very easy because together with Gloria and Nagel, we prove that a monomial Artinian ideal has the weak Lipschitz property even only if the multiplication by the linear form x0 plus x1 plus xn has always maximal one. This proof is not very complicated, but is very interesting because it <coughs> allows us to save a lot of time. We don't need to check what happens for all linear forms. It's enough to check what happens with respect to this particular linear form. And now a series of definitions. When I have an Artinian ideal generated by R forms, I said before that I will say that it is a Togliatti system if it fails with Lepce's property in degree d minus 1. I will say that I is a monomial Togliatti system if, in addition, this ideal can be generated by monomials. I will say that it is a smooth Togliatti system. If in addition, the rational variety associated to the inverse system is smooth. And finally, I will say that it is a monomial, so a minimal monomial Togliatti system if it is generated by monomials, M1, MR. And when I take a proper subset, I have an ideal which 
satisfy the <coughs> weak lectures property, an ideal which is no longer a Togliatti system. This name, Togliatti, came in honor to Eugenio Togliatti. Eugenio Togliatti was a geometer, an Italian geometer, that he classified all projections of the Veronese surface in finite, which satisfied at least a Laplace equation of order two. So in our language, he classified all monomial Togliatti systems of cubics in three variables. This was a work of this famous geometer, but it was funny that I use a lot the name of Togliatti, and one day I decided to Google Togliatti. And I Googled Togliatti, and one of the first entries was a city in the middle of Russia. And this was a surprise for me. It was a city in the southwest of Moscow. It was on the river, on the bank of the river Volga. It's the second biggest city of the state of Sumatra. And the previous name of this city was Estavospol or something like this, but in 1964 they decided to change the name of the city and they chose as a new name Togliatti. And they checked, why Togliatti? And the answer is that they decided to put this name in honor to Palmiro Togliatti. Who was Palmiro Togliatti? was the secretary of the Socialist Party, the Communist Party in Italy. And what is the relation between Palmiro and Eugenio Togliatti? They are brothers. So Palmiro Togliatti is the brother of Eugenio Togliatti, the famous geometer. And this is the funny things that you learn sometimes with Google, no? So let's come back to geometry. So as I said, Eugenio Togliatti classified all a smooth minimal monomial Togliatti systems of cubics in three variables. There is only one, is the ideal generated by x0 cube, x1 cube, x2 cube, x0, x1, x2. Together with Mateus Michale, we classify all a smooth minimal monomial Togliatti systems of quantics. And we prove the following result. We take i, uh, minimal smooth monomial Togliatti systems of quadrics in the polynomial ring k x0 x1 xn when you assume that n is greater or equal than 3. And we prove that there is a big partition of n plus 1 as a1 plus a2 where n minus 1 is greater or equal than a1, greater or equal than a2, greater or equal than 2, such that up to permutation of the coordinates, the ideal will be x0, xa1 minus 1 squared, plus xa1, xn squared. And this gives a complete classification of the minimal smooth monomial Togliatti systems of quadrics. To prove the result, we use a lot of graph theory, and it is the first time that we introduce the graph theory to study Togliatti systems. Now that we have a complete classification of the case of quadric, we can ask what happened with cubics. So next goal will be try to classify all a smooth minimal monomial Togliatti system of cubics. The first contribution to this problem was a conjecture, the conjecture of Ilardi, which says the following. The only smooth minimal monomial Togliatti system I of cubics, whose inverse system has n times n plus 1 minus 1 generators, is the one described in this slide. This conjecture has two parts. First, it claims that I is a smooth minimal monomial Togliatti system, and second, it claims that it is the only one. The first part is an exercise, it's quite easy to check that indeed this is an example of a smooth minimal monomial Togliatti system of cubics. Maybe the most difficult part is to check that 
it is smooth, but nowadays we have nice criterion for checking if a uh, toric variety is smooth or not. For instance, we can use Perkins on criterion, and it's not so complicated. But the second part, that is the only one, is false. Together with Tabjani and Mizzetti, we get many counterexamples, and here we have one counterexample. So this is another example of a smooth minimal monomial tabulated systems of cubics. So what about the classification? As I said, when we deal with three variables, it's the classical result of Eugenio Togliatti. We pass to four variables, and together with Mezzetti and Ottaviani, we succeed, and we prove that there are up to change of coordinate, we have only three different types of a smooth minimal monomial Togliatti systems of cubics. The three described in the slides. The first one corresponds to P3 that we blow up at four different points. The second one corresponds to P3 that to blow up at two points and a line we join the other two. And the third example corresponds to the blow up at P of P3 to two disjoint lines. And that's all. Maybe it's important to point out that if we delay the hypothesis of being a smooth, we have some other examples that we have also been able to classify. What happens if we increase the number of variables? In the same paper, together with Mizzetti and Ottaviani, we prove that when we work with n plus one variables, and when we take a partition of n plus one of type a1 plus A2 plus AS, where N minus 1 is greater or equal than A1, greater or equal than A2, greater or equal than AS, greater or equal than 1, and we consider the monomial ideal I, we get a family of examples of a smooth minimal monomial Togliatti systems of cubics. Again, for particular values of a1, A2, An minus 1, we get families of counterexamples to Ilardi's conjecture. And we conjecture that up to permutation of the coordinates, the examples described in the above slides are the only smooth minimal monomial to glacial systems of UX. And this conjecture is true. And in collaboration with Mateusz Michalek and using graph theory, we get the following result. Let I be a minimal a smooth monomial to get the systems of cubics. Then up to permutation of the coordinates, the pair I and its inverse system is one of the ideas described in the previous slides. Moreover, we can bound the number of generators and check in which cases they give a counterexample of Ilardi's conjecture. So we have now a full classification of minimal smooth monomial Togliatti systems of quadrics and a smooth minimal monomial Togliatti systems of cubics, and in both cases, graph theory has played an important role. We can try to go further and now classify a smooth minimal monomial Togliatti system generated by forms of homogeneous degree T. This problem nowadays seems out of reach. We have no idea how to attack this problem. And what we have tried with Mezzetti is to bound some of the invariants and the first idea was try to control the minimal number of generators. And we have got an upper and lower bound for the minimal number of generators of any smooth minimal monomial Togliatti systems or forms of degree D. The lower bound is 2n plus 1, 
and the upper bound is n plus d minus 1 shoes n minus 1. So now that we have this range, we can ask, try to classify all cognitive systems, as I said, seems out of reach, but maybe we can try to classify the minimal monomial cognitive system which reach either the lower bound or the upper bound. And another problem that we can try to address is if all values between the small, the, between the lower bound and the upper bound can be reached. So we can try to analyze existing results in this admissible range. Together with Mezzetti, we have succeeded in classifying the minimal monomial Togliatti systems whose minimal number of generators reach the lower bound. And we have seen that almost all of them are trivial, where trivial means the following. I will say that the Togliatti system is trivial if it contains the following forms of degree d, x not f, x1 f, x n f, where f is a fixed form of degree d minus 1. And why we call these systems trivial? We call these systems trivial because when you compute the Laplace equation of the associated variety, we easily realize that this Laplace equation is simply the vanishing of the partial derivative. Okay. Okay. Another observation is that a trivial monomial of that system can have only two n plus one generators of two n plus two generators. And both cases are possible. For instance, if I take d equal four with two n plus one generators, we have the following <coughs> trivial to systems the one generated by x0 to 4, x1 to 4, xn to 4, x0 cubed times x1, x2, xn. And with 2n plus 2 generators, we have the following trivial to the system, x0 to 4, xn to 4, x0, x1, x2 times x1, x So, concerning now the classification of the related systems which reach the lower bound, we have the following result. As I said, if I take the number of variables greater or equal than 3 and the degree of the monomials greater or equal than 4, then the minimal number of generators of a minimal monomial of the system is bounded by 2n plus 1. And we prove that the minimal number of generators is exactly 2n plus 1. In the following case, when i is trivial, or otherwise, the number of variables is exactly 3. The number of generators is 2 times 2 plus 1 is 5. And the degree has only two possibilities either is 4 or either is 5. If the degree is 4, we only have an example, and the associated variety is singular. If degree is 5, we only have an example, and the yes, associated toric variety is a smooth. We have also been able to classify automatic systems whose minimal number of generators are close to the lower bound, and essentially all of them are trivial, unless few exceptions, which corresponds again to the case of three variables, and now the degree is either five or seven. If the degree is five, we have three cases that we completely describe, and if the degree is four, we have, I mean, if the degree is seven, we have four cases that we also describe, and 
in these three cases and, and four cases, we also analyze when they are singular or when they are smooth. Of course, all results are always up to permutation of variables. I recall that the title of my talk was the ubiquity of the with Lepchis property, and as I said, Lepchis properties appear everywhere, and very recently we have related Artinian ideals which pairs with Lepchis property with Galois covers. And the result is the following one. We fix an integer d greater or equal than 3. <coughs> we take e a primitive root of 1 of order d. I take a diagonal matrix where in, in the diagonal we write e to the power a, e to the power b, e to the power c. Usually, uh, we need to assume that the greatest common divisor between D, A, B, and C is 1. And then we prove the following result. We fix an integer, D, greater or equal than 3, and a representation of the cyclic group, the zeta module D, a representation MABC of the cyclic group. I take the ideal i generated by all monomials which are invariant under the action of this matrix. And the first thing that we prove is that the number of generators is always bounded by d plus 1. And the other thing that we prove that this ideal is a Togliatti system. This Togliatti system because we prove <laughs> that it fails the with Lepchus property in degree d minus 1. And what is clear is that the map, the, uh, the morphism associated to this ideal, which is an Artemian ideal, defines a Galois cover with cycle group zeta module d. And this is now what we are really studying is the relation between Galois covers and Artinian ideals which fails the Wigglechus property. And this is all I wanted to say.
session, then it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Luis Gustavo Monato from the University of Sao Paulo, the famous USP. <laughs> and uh, now, leaving uh, New York University, but <coughs> yesterday he told me that he's coming back to Brazil. Yeah. And he's uh, a good example of how the United States uh, don't pretend that people. <laughs> but I think in this case, Brazil uh, won. Then he will speak about sp spatial temporal data analytics via graphs in processing. But uh, we are working the technical staff in order to arrange the, the music <laughs> the lecture. Okay. And Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction. And I have to thank a lot to the organizers for inviting me here, and in particular for uh, organizing all my the logistics for me to arrive here. It was very easy to arrive because everything was so perfectly arranged uh, that I could not even worry about anything. So thank you very much for all of this. Um, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about temp uh, spatial temporal data analysis. Uh, in particular, I will show you some uh, results from projects uh, I have been working with people from uh, NYU and also some collaborators from Brazil. So I should start uh, with some acknowledge here. Um, uh, in particular, this work is a, uh, was pr uh, accomplished together with two PhD, previous PhD students, Paola, that's now in INRIA, a postdoc in INRIA. Uh, Osebiedes is an assistant professor uh, at Federal University of Espírito Santo. Fabio Dias was uh, my previous uh, postdoc that is now uh, research staff in Toronto, Canada. Claudio Silva is a long-term collaborator at NYU, and we have been collaborating many different projects, including this one. And Fabian is also a long-term collaboration. And indeed, I started to work with uh, graph signal processing, encouraged, encouraged by uh, Fabiano, that was really in, uh, in interested in this subject in 2000. 15 or 16, if I'm not wrong. Okay, so a kind of three years ago, we started to work on this project. So before going some technologies here, I would like to uh, mix, um, motivate why this problem is important and why I decided to approach it using the mathematical tools I'm going to be showing you in a few minutes. So uh, I will try to convince you the importance of analyzing spatial temporal data using Three real examples uh, of problems I'm currently uh, dealing with. And the first one is the analysis of criminal data. 
So we uh, are collaborating with the police department in Sao Paulo city, uh, where the, the agents in charge of uh, public uh, safety uh, is trying to understand how crimes are spread around the city, which are the hotspots and more than this. They would like to understand how the crime evolves over time and which are the patterns of this, the crime in the city. No? Another uh, important problem that I, I have been, uh, uh, that involves spatial temporal data, and it, this is a collaboration with New York University, is how to understand the mobility. So essentially, we have information about public transportation in, in Manhattan, and we try to use this information not only to better planning the traffic in the city, but also using this data to understand the behavior of the population and how uh, the habits of the population changes, you no know, depending on several factors like weather or period of the day and so on. And finally, a third uh, problem we are uh, dealing with is uh, social media, geo-referenced social media like Twitter and something like that, that you know when you Twitter something, you have a geolocalization from where you are doing that. So using this uh, uh, geo-referenced information, we can try to understand how the population is communicating and more than this, which are the subjects around the city and how this subject changes over time and how the social factors impact in, in the subjects that people uh, is talking about around the city. Okay, so all those three problems are typical examples of spatial temporal uh, data and uh, information and the, the way this data is organized is something like this. We have a graph this graph might be, for example, the street map of the city or any other uh, geo-referenced uh, information from which you can generate, for example, uh, a graph. No? For each node of the graph, we have a signal or we have a, a, a function that is defined on, on the nodes of the graph. And this function uh, changes over time. So we have uh, time. So essentially, we have a time series associated to each node of the graph. So we have a graph and a time series associated to each node. And the main goal is trying to understand you know, how uh, this uh, time series behaves and how they interact, and more specifically, which are the phenomena and the patterns that uh, are written you know, uh, on the data. Okay, so this is the, the main goal of this kind of analysis I'm going to be presenting here. Um, there are many different techniques to try to extract patterns and understand this kind of data. However, in the last uh, few years, uh, graph signal processing emerged as one of the main um, alternatives in this contest. Okay, so the, the main idea of graph signal processing is essentially trying to extend uh, concepts uh, from the classical signal processing theory to the context of graphs. So the domain is not a regular domain anymore and is a com completely unstructured domain given by a graph. Okay, so this is essentially the, the idea. And uh, the main problem is how to define, for example, important uh, 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 structures like Fourier transform and f uh, linear filtering and so on in the, in the context of graphs. So this is essentially what I'm going to be showing you here and uh, some of our collaboration in this context. So before I'm going uh, to the analysis of this uh, spatial temporal data itself, let me present you some concepts uh, related with graph signal process. The main building block of graph signal process is, is the graph Laplacian. Okay? So essentially, if you have a graph with a set of nodes, edges, and weight associated to the edges, we can define the weight matrix as uh, non-zero in the entries i, j, where there exists an edge connecting the nodes i with the nodes h. So essentially, we have a square matrix with n by n, where n is the number of nodes, and one entry in this matrix is going to be different from zero if there is an edge connecting the node i and the node j. Okay? 
And the graph Laplacian is essentially a combination of two matrix, this weight matrix and a diagonal matrix uh, uh, generated essentially by summing up the rows from the weight matrix. Okay, so the definition is very simple. There are other definitions for Laplacian, uh, graph Laplacians as well. This is uh, what people call a known uh, normalized graph Laplacian. And it's not difficult to show that this matrix is a symmetric, uh, 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 positive semi-definite matrix, okay? So, given these properties, we know that we can uh, uh, compute the spectral decomposition of the Laplacian, um, uh, graph Laplacian matrix, where U here is the eigenvector uh, matrix, and uh, sigma uh, contains the eigenvalues uh, uh, from the spectral decomposition. We know that all the eigenvalues are greater or equal to zero, Essentially, the first eigenvalue is equal to zero, and the multiplicity is going to be one if the graph is connected. Okay? And we're going to be assuming here all the graphs we're going to be playing with are connected. Okay? So we have only one eigenvalue equals zero. Um, we can see the eigenvectors as functions def defined on the vertex of the graph. So essentially, for each node of the graph, I have a value that comes from the eigenvalue, the eigenvector, sorry. And, and what is very interesting about the eigenvectors of the Laplacian, uh, the graph Laplacian, is the, a property uh, described by the discrete currents uh, nodal theorem. That this, this property essentially tells us the following. If you consider the uh, one eigenvector, this eigenvector will split the graph in regions where the eigenvector is positive and uh, where it is negative. And even more interesting is the following. If we start to considering eigenvectors associated with larger eigenvalues, the number of regions where the eigenvector is positive or negative tends to increase with the eigenvalue. So the larger the, the eigenvalue, the more uh, nodal regions we have, or we tend to have more uh, nodal regions uh, given, uh, generated by the eigenvector. Okay, so this is a, a property uh, uh, given by the, the Kuran's theorem. Um, so we can see that the, the eigenvectors presents a oscillatory behavior quite similar to uh, Fourier basis. Okay, so essentially, if we consider the eigenvalues as frequencies then we can assume that the eigenvectors are going to be the basis functions or the Fourier basis associated to the frequencies. Okay? So using these two concepts, we can define the graph Fourier transform as essentially um, the projection of a given function on the Fourier basis or on the eigenvector basis. Okay? So this is exactly the same definition as in the classical Fourier transform, where we are projecting a signal on the, the, the Fourier basis. And here, we are doing essentially the same, just replacing the contest for graphs. Okay? And in matrix notation, we can see that the Fourier transform, the graph Fourier transform is essentially the multiplication of U transpose by uh, F. We can also compute the inverse, you know, doing the inverse operation over here. And uh, here is one example of this. So we have a graph, we have a, a smooth function defined on this graph. This is essentially a, a Gaussian function here. If we compute the graph Fourier transform, we see something like this. You know, you, you, it's easy to notice that, for example, since this is a, a low frequency signal, the energy of the, 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 Fourier, the graph Fourier transform is concentrated on the left side close to the low frequency eigenvalues. And if we, it's not easy to see here, but you see some spikes. No? So it's essentially a graph where we have some spikes no? uh, in some nodes, and other nodes are zero. And you can see if you com when you compute the, the graph Fourier transform, the energy is concentrated in high frequencies. Okay? This is exactly the behavior we should observe in the classical uh, Fourier context as well. Okay, so now, uh, we'd like to, to define the equivalent of uh, spectral filtering in the context of graphs. Okay? 
So just a quick recap here. If you remember, the, the, con uh, the convolution is an essential comp component to define a uh, filtering. And the classical definition of convolution is given by this integral over here. And we know that the Fourier transform of convolution is essentially a product in the spectral domain. And another important property is that if we define a linear time invariant filter, we know that uh, there exists a function h such that the result of this filtering is, is the same as convolving the function f by this, fu this uh, function uh, h, you know, that is the input signal. The problem to extend this concept to graphs is essentially the shift operation. No? Because to define convolution, I would need to define this shift operation here. And in graph, the, the, that doesn't make sense, because what would mean the subtraction between two nodes? No? So uh, you cannot extend directly this to graph. However, the graph Fourier transform allows us to define the convolution in an indirect way. So essentially, what we can do is the following. If, you, if, you ha if we have two functions defined on the nodes, we compute the, the graph Fourier transform of those two nodes, compute the product, and compute the inverse of the Fourier transform, and then we have the convolution defined on the nodes of the graph. Okay? So this is a trick. And here is essentially uh, the the how uh, the, the, the convolution is going to be computed in each vertices uh, of the graph. Okay? Uh, so now we, we, we can define the spectral filtering by essentially compute you know, the inverse of the graph Fourier transform of the function and the filter. So the, the, the way uh, people uh, perform the filter is essentially define age in the spectral domain directly. No? So in, in general, we don't define age in the, in, in the graph domain, but in the spectral domain and only compute the inverse of the product. Uh, it's not difficult to show that the result of this operation over here is the same as applying the filter to the Laplacian matrix. Okay? And essentially, uh, we can just modify the eigenvectors, the eigenvalues. Here is an example. We have uh, a noise uh, function defined on the graph. He, here you, you can see the, uh, the, the graph uh, Fourier transform, the spectral representation of that signal. And here we have the final low pass filter and filter out the signal. You see that we have a much smoother uh, solution or or function over here, OK? OK, so we see that it's not uh, difficult to define the convolution and the filter operation in graphs. However, a main issue in this contest is how to design filters with proper uh, behavior or filters that uh, result in, 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 in functions or uh, filtered results that uh, give me some important properties. You know? So let me show you w one example over here. So suppose that I have a function, and, and we know that this function is uh, contaminated by noise. Okay? And we would like to remove the noise of the function. So how can I design a filter to remove the noise of the function? So essentially, the problem I'm trying to solve is this one. I would like to design a filter H such that when I apply the filter to F, I will get a new function that is close enough to the original function, however, is much smoother than the original function f. Okay, so the solution of this problem is essentially uh, noise removal uh, filtering. And we can show, I'm, I'm not presenting the, the, the computation here, but we can show that the solution for this problem is given by this simple filter over here. Okay, so this filter is the min uh, minimizes this uh, problem. Okay. Here, an example. I have a step, a noise step function. Here, the function is one in f on the right, zero on the left, and we are we add some noise on this function. Here is only the um, the histogram of the function. Due to the noise, we we don't have the uh, peak in one and zero. And this is the result when we apply the filter I showed you before. So essentially, we, we have a transition here, but 
the, the histogram is much better concentrated around one and zero. Okay, so another problem of filtering design. We know that uh, if we have um, uh, in classical uh, signal processing theory, we know that the Laplacian of Gaussian filter is uh, a very useful mechanism to detect edges of a function. What uh, I mean by edges? Essentially, if you have a function that presents some abrupt variation, then the Laplacian of Gaussian essentially gives you the position where this uh, abrupt variation is taking place. So essentially, what we, we, we can do is we can compute the Laplacian of the function and look for the zero crossing of the Laplacian. That's essentially the, 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 the positions where the, 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 the gradient is maximum. However, the, the Laplacian is quite sensitive to noise. No? So if you apply the gradient directly to the function, the noise will result in many of those zero crossing. So what people do is to smooth the function first using a Gaussian and then compute the Laplacian in order to identify the zero crossing. So this is a filter very common in the context of signal processing and used, for example, to detect edges in image or even in, in, in other type of signals. Okay? And the problem is, how do you like to define this filter in the context of graphs? Okay, in order to, def to identify uh, edges in, in a graph. So how can I do it? So essentially what I have to do is I have to, to come up with a, a filter H such that the operation of H in a function F should be similar to something like this. I should uh, have a, 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 a Laplacian um, computation and the zero crossing of this filter should give me the edges, okay? So the solution for this problem is given by this filter over here, and where the sigma is just a parameter that controls how, is, uh, is how much is moving you are applying with the Gaussian. And what is interesting about this is that you can show mathematically that this uh, filter matches exactly the log filter in 1D case. So if you have a graph that is linear, then this filter is exactly the same as the log filter in the regular, in the classical signal processing, okay? So here is an example. We have, again, the step function, as I showed you before. And here are three different versions of the, the G log filter varying the smoothness uh, parameter, okay? So the larger the smoothness parameter, the less uh, oscillatory you're gonna be the filter, okay? The result of the filter. And considering, for example, this uh, filter over here, of course, the, the blue means where the, the, the G log function is uh, po in, uh, positive, red negative, or vice versa. And then we can compute the zero crossing. And we can also uh, see how uh, intense is the zero crossing, you know, computing essentially the difference between the, the, the two nodes. And you can filter out the, the edges by considering only the strong edges, uh, the strongest edges uh, in, the, in the graph, okay? Okay, so now let me, sh let me show you how we apply all this machinery to analyze uh, spatial temporal data, okay? So, uh, in the context of sp spatial temporal data, we have a, a not a function in only the device, but we have the temporal component, so essentially we have a function in each time slice, okay? Uh, so for each node, we have a time series, and what we would like to do is to understand this time series by analyzing the, the edges computed by the glog uh, function. So what, uh, one thing that I'm gonna do here is the following. I will define the probability of a node becoming uh, an edge node. How, how I do this? I compute the, the edge node using the glog filter in each time slice, and then I, for a fixed node, I sum up how many times that node becomes an edge node. And then I end up with a probability of a node 
no become an add node considering all the time steps, okay? So now fixing a particular time steps, time step, I have a, a, a configuration no, of edge nodes, and then I can uh, use this, the probability of this configuration to define a notion of entropy of a diamond lattice. Okay? So essentially, I can compute how uh, random uh, time slice is by looking the entropy, okay? And here is an example. So in, in this uh, example over here, I'm using the number of ta uh, taxi pickups in Manhattan. Here, the street map of Manhattan is using as the graph domain. In each corner, what I'm doing is I'm computing the number of people taking taxis in a neighborhood of this corner in intervals of 30 minutes. Okay, so for each 30 minutes, I sum up the number of people and I put this as the value in the time series, and I do that for a whole week. Okay? Here is just the total number of time pickup after one week. So as you can see, we, we cannot see almost anything in, in the island because around Penn Station and Port Authority, you know, the number of time pickups is so much larger than in the rest of the city that we cannot visualize anything. So this is already shows you um, one problem in using statistic, uh, statistical methods to analyze this kind of signal. Because you have, if you compute average or something like that, everything is going to be dominated by those two nodes. Over here. And on the right, we can see the probability of a node become an edge node. When you see these probabilities, then much more information is revealed. So for example, be, uh, besides uh, the neighborhood around um, uh, Penn Station and Port Authority, we see, for example, something happening in, uh, uh, near the Grand Central Station, uh, around the embassies here. Uh, this is that region with very luxurious hotels over there. And here is the Broadway, close to the, um, the Fifth Avenue. So those are very important places in the city. So just by looking at the probabilities, we can understand the behavior of the taxi pickups much better than analyzing the raw data uh, only. Here is the entropy diagram. Okay, so essentially for each time step, I have an entropy, and I'm plotting the entropy over time. So the first thing that we, we note is entropy tends to increase along the day with a, a drop you know, around 5 a.m. You know? And another very interesting uh, phenomenon here is I can cluster the, the edge node configuration in order to identify patterns. Okay? So the colors here correspond to uh, edge node configurations that are similar. And you see that by clustering uh, the, the configurations, we split the behavior of tax pickups very well depending on the period of the day. So just to give an idea, for example, here is in the early morning, tax pickups is mostly concentrated around pay station and port authority. If we go to the, the morning before lunch, this starts to spread you know, uh, to the region with the embassies, the, the, the hotels, and so on. Um, in the afternoon, tax pickups start to come down to the south of the island, close to the 4th Avenue and Union Square. During the night, start to spread to Soho, uh, meatpacking district, where we have restaurants and so on. Late night, spread all around the city, but mostly in the east side, where most of the, the, the nightlife happens in, in Manhattan. And in the down, keeps completely concentrated in the east side, where people is just enjoying the bars. Okay, so just analyzing the behavior of the, the edges, we can understand how the population behaves on the city. What is the, 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 the habits of the people? And if you have to plan you know, uh, uh, how taxes should be distributed in the city, obviously we should concentrate taxes in this neighborhood during the night. Okay? We did the same with crime data in Sao Paulo City. Uh, 
he, uh, here we have the total number of uh, passerby robbery in, in, in a neighborhood of the city center. So he's Praça da Sé in Sao Paulo, and we got a neighborhood of five kilometers from Praça da Sé. Okay? Here, sorry, here we have the, um, the probability of a node becoming uh, uh, an edge node. Okay? So you see that most of the criminal activities is concentrated around the city center, but we see some clouds uh, spread. Analyzing the entropy diagram, if you look the high entropy points, what the high entropy means, that here the behavior of crime is more random. So probably what is happening is crimes are taking place in, in locations where it's not expected. Okay, so if you look at this, we see that in these regions, crimes are taking place you know, in locations that are not close to the city center. So this is a very good indicative to the police to understand when and why this phenomenon is happening. This is, in general, due to uh, the action of uh, gangs uh, that operates exactly in that uh, moment. And if we look the low entropy uh, nodes or time slices, we see that the low entropy is only related with the city center. Okay, so again, this uh, edge um, analysis allows us to understand the behavior of the signal uh, over time. Okay, so uh, this uh, was what we did using essentially filtering mechanism, and I would like to show some results regarding uh, wavelets on graphs. Okay. So, um, just a quick reminder about wavelets. We know that wavelets bases are generated essentially shifting and scaling uh, a modern wavelet. Um, we know that the wavelet transforms essentially the projection of the function on this basis. And we know that to be a, a modern wavelet, this function should satisfy the admissibility condition. Okay? And, this admiss in the, and this condition over here essentially tells us that the wavelet base should be a band pass filter. Um, in order to make this happening in the context of graph, we have again to define the shift operation and the scaling. And the problem is that we cannot do this uh, uh, in a direct way. So we, the shifting phenomenon could be done um, in many different ways, but in the context of wavelets, what we are doing is the following. Uh, we know that shifting a function is equivalent to convolve this function with the delta function, okay? Uh, positioned in, in, a, in a position A, okay? So using the property of convolution I showed you before, we can define the translation of a function in the graph domain as the inverse Fourier transform you know, of the convolution, uh, of the Fourier transform of the delta and the function uh, back to the uh, graph domain. Uh, this uh, square root of n here is just a, a normalization factor that ensures that the mean of the signal is preserved when I'm making this translation. Uh, regarding the dilatation or the scaling factor, we know that the, the, the Fourier transform of the scaling is given by the multiplication in the Fourier <coughs> domain. So we use this property to define the scaling in the graph domain as well. Okay? So this is pretty straightforward. A main problem is that uh, maybe the scaling uh, takes you now beyond your domain, because uh, the, 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 the spectral domain goes from zero to the maximum eigenvalue, and once you scale, you can fall no, beyond this, so you have to take care to make sure that you are, uh, what you are doing, you're going to be uh, inside this interval. Um, another very important property is the following. Uh, if you scale a, f a, a, a band pass function no, in, the, in the time domain, this is equivalent to uh, shrink and shift this band pass uh, function uh, in the spectral domain. Okay? So uh, this is not difficult to show. So this is essentially the Mexican hat wavelet. 
And if you start to stretch the Mexican hat, essentially what you do is shrinking you know, the spec his spectral uh, representation uh, in the spectral domain. And to complete the basis, we always need the scaling uh, function. Okay? So this is a, a, a quite classical results from wavelet uh, theory. Uh, so any, uh, a complete representation of a function demands all of this. And R Raymond, in 2008, or I believe it's 2008, proved that if we generate some kernels using this function over here in the spectral domain, and if we, def if we define uh, a scaling function by this formula over here, then we have a, a, a tight frame wavelet basis uh, well-defined in the graph domain. So essentially, what this function does is to define this uh, kind of kernels over here in the spectral domain that behave similarly to what I showed you before. So if you increase the S, you have a shifting phenomena that is starting to shrink those filters you know, close to zero, and we have to define also the scaling function over here. So using this definition, we can define the wavelet basis uh, like this. And we can compute the wavelet transform just by projecting the function on the top of the wavelet basis. So essentially, what we have for each node of the graph, we have a configuration of coefficients that is the projection of the function in the, the wavelet base defined on that vertex. And what is even more interesting is the following. If the vertex is a high frequency vertex, then the coefficients are going to be concentrated in, in the high frequency uh, part of the, 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 the spectrum, the wavelet spectrum. And if we have a node that is a low frequency node, then the energy of the coefficients start to get concentrated in the uh, left side. Okay? So this is also provide us a pattern to understand how the signal uh, is behaving uh, in the graph domain. So how can you use this to analyze spatial temporal data again? Okay. Here, wh what we're going to be doing is something different uh, from what we did in the case of uh, edges. Because I would like to make a, a joint analysis of space and time. Now, if you remember, in, in, in the case of, uh, uh, in the previous case, w when we were computing the, um, the, the edges, I process each time slice independently. So there, there was no connection no, between time slices. And here what I'm doing is the following. I'm connecting the time slices no, using a linear graph. So by the end of the day, what I have is a full graph that is spatial and temporal. Okay? Um, and the main problem to be solved here is how to handle this kind of structure uh, computationally, because this can become very huge you know, uh, easily. Because if you have a long time series, for example, you know, this graph will become very, very big. But one thing that helps us a lot is the following. We know that the spectrum of a Cartesian graph you know, is essentially, you, you can derive the spectrum of Cartesian graph from the spectrum of each one of the, the components. So we know that, for example, if you have uh, U and uh, lambda as the eigenpair for G, and V and mu the eigenpair of H, then the sum of those two eigenvalues is an eigenvalue of the Cartesian product, and the Kronecker uh, product uh, between the two eigenvectors is an eigenvector of the product. Okay? So this makes the computation, the, the computation of the eigenvalues and eigenvector of the product graph uh, computationally feasible. Otherwise, it would be impossible, as I'll show you in a few seconds. Uh, we developed a system you know, based on this uh, concept. And just to give an idea, for that tax pickup I showed you before, if you consider the joint space and time analysis, we end up with a graph with 1.5 million <coughs> nodes and two, more than 2 million edges. So if you decide to compute all the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of a matrix of this big, you take forever. So it, it would be impossible you know, to do this computationally. And thanks to the property I showed you before, is it possible to do? Oh, it's difficult to see, you know? 
Uh, let me see if I can show you a live demo of this. Okay, let, I'm not sure I'll be able to operate this properly, but is it possible to see there? Yeah. So essentially, what this uh, visualization here is telling us is the following. If we position, uh, it's not working as I expected. Okay, I'll keep it fixed here. So essentially what the system is telling us is the following. Uh, the blue is the number of nodes in, in the downtown Manhattan that are classified as low frequency nodes based on the distribution of wavelet coefficients. The, the other colors here corresponds to uh, nodes that are classified as median or high frequency nodes. So we see that most of the nodes in Manhattan are low frequency because the larger this uh, the thicker is this, the more nodes classified as uh, low frequency nodes uh, we have. And what is interesting is we can see the behavior of the, 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 the days of the week. So we somehow Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday are similar in terms of behavior. We have a peak around 7 p.m. Um, but during the weekend, no, the behavior changes uh, completely. But what is even more interesting in this uh, system over here is trying to understand the high frequency nodes. Because high frequency indicates us that something different or unexpected is happening temporarily and spatially. Let me see if I can find. Is it possible to see a small red point over here? So when we start to analyze this, we know, start to identify the, the, the high frequency nodes, and then we could try to figure out which is happening you know, in that neighborhood to make that node a high frequency node. So it was easy, for example, when we look here, because this is close to the high line, so in certain periods of the day, a lot of people goes there. Here is the Port Authority, Payne Station. All of this was very easy to explain. However, this point over here was not so easy. Why not? Because we note this red point, that this, the red means this point is a high frequency, spatially and temporally. So it's a very high frequency point. And we went to Google Maps trying to figure out what was happening in that neighborhood. And nothing is there. It's essentially uh, stores, and you see that this point is happening you know, around 1 a.m. You know? And of, of course, the, 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 the stores uh, are already closed at this time, and we could, could not see any restaurants there because the restaurants are placed over here, and then we could not uh, understand what is going on. So the only solution would be to ask, uh, ask to a taxi driver what is happening there. No, and then we started to ask to several taxi drivers, and one of those, uh, those guys told us, now look, during the summer, this week was taken in August, there is a basement in exactly this region over here where people go, takes th their instrument and goes there to play together. So no re no, uh, people just arrive with their instruments, start to play together, and stay there all you know, night long. And this only happens in August. So we are lucky enough to get the data exactly in August, and this also shows that this idea of wavelets is um, precise enough to capture not big events, but very localized events in space and time. So this helps a lot to understand phenomena in the city and identify um, what uh, the, the energy of the city and the behavior and the dynamics of the city over time. Let me go back to the... Okay, so since I could make the... Okay, so some conclusions. Um, 
we saw that the graph signal processing is a very powerful mechanism to analyze spatial temporal uh, data. Um, the, this idea of edge detection for graphs uh, turns out to be very uh, useful and e effective not only to detect events, but also to generate patterns that's easy to interpret and uh, uh, understand. Uh, the graph wavelet transform uh, uh, enables uh, simultaneous um, space and time analysis of the data, what is very important and very difficult to do with other techniques as well. Most of the techniques uh, uh, described in the literature operate uh, spatially and then try to combine the results, but doing uh, uh, space and time simu simultaneously is not so easy. And for the future, uh, I would like to leave some guidelines here. Um, the use of machine learning to design opt optimal filters is a very hot topic nowadays. There are a lot of people working on this direction because, uh, as you can imagine, it's not so easy to deduce mathematically those filters, so it's much easier to learn the filter using data. So people are really going in this direction now. Um, uh, another uh, important problem that is not uh, solved yet is how to interpret the wavelet coefficient in terms of space and time. So how much space or time are contributing to the coefficient? This is not easy to, to understand. Uh, and uh, there are people uh, really concerned about this and trying to uh, come up with some uh, mathematical tools to explain this. And also another very hot topic is the combination of graph signal processing with deep learning. You know, uh, as you know, um, deep learning is making a, a revolution <laughs> around the world, but it demands a regular domain to operate. And now, in the last few years, people is starting to use graph signal processing as uh, a resource to enable deep learning on graphs. Okay? And that's pretty much what I have to tell you. Thank you very much. This last slide is uh, really very, very important and very interesting. In particular, I believe, uh, it seems to me that understanding, the, the very understanding of deep neural networks, including convolutional neural networks, it is possible that you can apply the same methods. Yeah. Because you, you also have a graph with weights and so on. You are fully right. Yeah. And I think that this would be... <laughs> Yeah. something uh, very desirable to have. We are working on that in, the, in our project. We yeah. are trying to use this theory to explain deep learning. Yeah. Okay. And now, just as a matter of, uh, you know, to know uh, how much computing effort or time you need asymptotically in terms of the number of nodes. Yeah, th th there is a, a trick we can use here that I, I didn't have time to explain you, but uh, uh, in 2014, the, the, the Heyman that proposed that wavelet theory, he came up with a, a mechanism to approximate the filters using uh, Chebyshev polynomials. So, uh, and that makes the computation really quick now. So nowadays we don't compute the eigenvec uh, eigenvalues anymore, we just compute the largest one and use Chebyshev polynomials to approximate everything. It works very well and computationally it's like this. Yeah, but before it was a painful task, I have to tell you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. The first question is related to the fact that uh, in signal theory, uh, time invariant filters are convolution filters. Mm -hmm. What happens in the case of graphs? The, the case of uh, Invariant time uh, filters mm -hmm. are convolution filters. Yes. What happens in the case of graphs? So, uh, when you def I'm not sure if I 
get exactly what you, you, you want from me. But uh, the, the point is, the, the filters, you never define the filters in the graph itself. You always define the filter in the spectral domain. So, uh, because define the filter in the graph is almost impossible, because you cannot control the effect of the graph. So, mm -hmm. so what people do essentially is define the, the, assume that the filter is uh, linear time invariant, you know, that is for grant, and then define the filter in the spectral domain and just compute the, the, the inverse Fourier transform to see what is going on. That's okay. the way they do it. And the second one is uh, how about uh, prediction? About the? Prediction. The that prediction. means uh, prediction yeah. uh, filter. This, this, this is a very uh, interesting question. And a lot of people is, um, work on this right now because we know that those, those coefficients that come, up, come up, uh, out with the wavelet and also the, 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 the edge computation, they are features that you can use to make predictions. You know? So although the, the first results we are uh, having in this direction are not that good, we are really excited that in a near future, you know, we believe in a couple of months, uh, we could make very serious crime predictions using the wavelet coefficients. And we are getting pretty close to that already. So it's just a matter of tuning the deep learning tools you know, to work with this kind of feature we are providing. And, but the results are getting better and better and better. And I believe that in the near future, we can predict crimes Mm -hmm. with a certain you know, reliability using this theory. Well, uh, I think as conclusion that the difference between economics and mathematics is economics predicts the past and probably mathematics must predict the future. <laughs> yeah. This is very relevant <laughs> in behavior, uh, behavioral sciences. <laughs> That's very true. Okay, if there are not uh, more questions, thanks again the speaker and now... <laughs> We have a break. Uh, yes, we are going to have uh, our um, coffee break. Just write down here. Huh? Here.